Now, becoming a teacher involves becoming literate in a whole new language. There's the language of pedagogy and curriculum, and there's also a language of assessment. And we call this assessment literacy. So this is your ability to understand all of the complexities of assessment, the techniques, the principles, the terminology. And it allows you then to craft and be effective in setting assessment and conducting assessment. Now, assessment literacy can also extend to students where they understand these processes around assessment. And we'll discuss a little bit about that. But primarily at the moment, we're looking at your assessment literacy so that you can uh, manage the assessment processes and measure your students' learning and provide them with support as a result of that measurement. So there are a range of different aspects of assessment literacy and a set of principles and practices for effective assessment. So read through these. They include some terminology that you're going to become very familiar with, such as validity and reliability, um, accessibility. Um, and every assessment item that you get, create or tasks that you use with your students should incorporate these various principles because partly they'll make your assessment fairer. They'll also make it more robust and less subject to uh, manipulation and abuse, um, cheating for want of a better word. Um, they'll allow for comparability and um, ways of improving your assessment over time. So there's also aspects around accessibility so that all students are fairly treated in terms of assessing their learning. Um, if you've got some students that are dyslexic or hard of hearing or poor vision, um, or they may not have an understanding of certain contexts. And if you've set various language barriers or contextual barriers, such as asking them, or say setting a context about a movie that was set 20 years ago, before they were born. Um, makes an awful lot of sense to you, but may make very little sense to your students. So there's a whole range of contextual barriers, language barriers that you need to consider, particularly if some of your students might be from non-English speaking backgrounds. Um, so these are all aspects that you need to consider when framing assessment tasks. Other things, things like transparency and informative. So it should be clear to your students how they're being assessed. Um, there are rare occasions when you might want to obscure assessment and um, so forth, but in the main, we want students to be fully aware of how they're being assessed and so that they can perform to their best knowing um, what is occurring. Um, so your assessment should be informative, should inform not only yourself about the student's learning, but inform your students about how they're going with their learning may also inform their parents, might inform the school system, might inform potential future employers. There could be a whole range of different um, stakeholders around the assessment. But there are also issues around privacy. Um, assessment of your students is something that's quite personal to them. Something we don't do very well at in education, um, keeping assessment details private. Um, but it is the collection of personal data about your students, and this data could have detrimental effects if it is used in inappropriate ways, including being inappropriately used by yourself or by the school. Um, and so you need to consider those aspects when you collect such data. Now, as a basis of that, it should be evidence, should be formed on the basis of evidence. Now, you are going to have your own gut feeling about the progress of your students. And that's perfectly okay, and it's actually incredibly accurate. But whenever you make a formal judgment about your students, you need to be able to back that up with evidence. Now, the first thing will be, if your students ask you, why did they get that B instead of the A? Or when the parents come in and ask you, why did their child get a B instead of an A? You need to be able to point out exactly why. And some of the ways we do that is we have criteria, that specify exactly what the students need to have demonstrated in order to achieve various um, standards. And there then needs to be evidence showing that they have or have not met that standard. And that is generally what we expect students to provide 
in order for us to gather that evidence. But it is contentious. Some of that can be open to interpretation. And that's where we have what's called a process of moderation, where we may get a number of teachers to look at assessment items or students' assess, um, work and see if there is a consensus then about how um, judgments have been derived. And we'll talk a bit about that as we go. Now, assessment should also be ongoing and ideally relatively continuous. So we're um, collecting multiple instances of students demonstrating their ability uh, rather than just being on a single instance, which might be just a bad day for the student or they might have had a, a fight with their best friend and it might not have just been particularly conducive. So if there's multiple opportunities for them to demonstrate, then that's less likely to be um, disrupted by particular events. It should be aligned to what they're learning and to how you're teaching, so aligning it to curriculum and pedagogy. Um, and it should be authentic. It should be validly assessing what you're intending to assess. Now, again, we often do this fairly poorly in um, teaching. There's relatively few instances, for example, in teaching digital technologies where you would assess students' spelling. Um, now, it's not to say that you shouldn't assess students' spelling, but that would be a criteria related possibly to literacy and numeracy general capabilities, which we don't include as part of our formal assessment in digital technologies. You won't find an assessment standard related to that. Likewise, assessing referencing, commonly done, but inappropriate. It's not authentic. It's not really related to what you need to be actually assessing students. So this comes down to you knowing the curriculum and knowing the learning outcomes and um, achievement standards that students need to demonstrate against. And you need to design your assessment tasks then to allow students to actually be measured on those standards. Flexibility is another approach. Um, you want to be able to have a, a range of different assessment approaches so that some students will be good at tests, some will be great at projects, some will be really good at written tasks, some will be good at um, calculations and um, complex uh, aspects of coding. So having a range and a flexible approach to um, assessment in terms of what you're assessing, but also how you're assessing um, various techniques and approaches. And then we have the concept of formative and summative assessment. There's also diagnostic assessment. Now, formative is where students are essentially given a practice go. It's designed to provide you and the students with information about how they're going with their learning. Diagnostic assessment is very similar. We're using it to diagnose and understand how students are going. Summative assessment is where we're making a, a formal, normally it's final assessment of students' learning. It's going to be a measure that would be then reported to others, um, and it's what we call high stakes versus low stakes formative assessment. So it's something that could have consequences for them in terms of their grades or their um, various other aspects. So that's, we generally talk about formative and summative. Formative being things that you just can do during class time and so forth. Summative are generally things that are pre-planned and scheduled as part of an on, uh, ongoing assessment program. Okay, other things you need to be aware of, various purposes of assessment. Um, one of the key ones is around using assessment for learning. Assessment is a fantastic mechanism to focus students' attention and engagement. And if you are crafting your assessment task so that it supports their learning, in addition to measuring their learning, it can be an effective approach to using assessment, particularly for formative assessment. Um, so there's assessment for learning, and there's also assessment as learning. So, in this case, you could be you're trying to measure a students' ability to learn. Um, so you're looking at, say, their ability to learn coding, and you're making a measure of that as part of your assessment process. And that allows students to then monitor their own progress around that and to improve upon that, so they can improve their mechanisms for actually learning and get better at that. <laughs> 
And then finally, there's assessment of learning. And that's the summative assessment where you've got some particular standards that you want to measure students against. And often they're comparable so that you can compare students um, against those particular standards. Okay, there's also various uses for, for assessment. Um, part of it is to for diagnostic and formative processes so that you understand how students are going, how your students understand how they're going, and so that can be improved upon. And then of course there's summative assessment and a range of others that you can also read about. But essentially we have that formative summative assessment process, also diagnostic assessment, feedback assessment, particularly when it comes to um, formal reporting, say to parents, but also just you might want to do some assessment to provide your students with um, some feedback on their progress. And then there's also assessment for program evaluation, where you're assessing what's happening so that you can actually improve your own teaching, but also the structure of the program and potentially the structure of the curriculum. So that's where the assessment is not necessarily focused on the students, but we're using that outcome to inform other mechanisms that can be improved upon. But essentially assessment should always be seen as around some sort of process of improvement. Summative is sometimes um, goes beyond that and um, is not necessarily about improvement, but most other aspects of assessment involve um, a mechanism of improvement. And that's why feedback is such an important element of assessment. Um, apart from summative assessment, we should always provide students with feedback so that they can improve upon, they can use what they learn about their performance to better that performance. Okay, then there's some different types of assessment. Um, Knowledge-based, so um, tests and quizzes and written assignments, and things of that nature. There's practical assessments. We do a lot of that in um, digital technologies where students perform a task and they're measured against being able to do a task, such as write a program or conduct a query or collect data, things of that nature. There's performance-based assessment, where they have to um, perform in some way. So this could be um, to do with a project and they're taking on a role within a project. Um, it could be a presentation that they're conducting. Um, and there's various other performance-based assessments. It's very similar to practical assessments, but there is a performative element of that. Then we have self-assessments, where students can self-assess themselves and reflect upon their own learning. And we can also have peer assessment, where you can have students assess each other. And there's various mechanisms to do that fairly, um, sometimes anonymously, sometimes through um, various online mechanisms that can um, reduce the effect of um, bias, where friends don't tend to assess each other particularly harshly, um, and things of that nature. Okay, and finally there's some ethical and um, legal implications of assessment. Talked a little bit about privacy, but there are other aspects around that of confidentiality. So particularly once you've collected that data, you want to make sure that that data doesn't become accessible by others. Um, now in schools we don't pay an awful lot of attention to that, we should, but confidentiality of assessment data is important. Um, your students do have rights and those rights are legal rights. Um, so you can get into considerable trouble, now, it very rarely happens in a school environment, but there is that potential. Also it has to do with fairness and equity. Um, if you start sharing that information to others, then it may give advantage to other students um, and a whole range of elements that could be involved in that. Um, you also want to ensure that the assessment is valid and reliable. Um, and again, if the assessment is, is too open, then students might be able to disrupt that fairness and process. Um, say if you release all the scores and then a student that has an extension or they're away sick comes back and can do their assessment in the full knowledge of how other students progressed and so forth, then that may not be fair. 
There's also some ethical and legal compliances that you need to work within. Sometimes it's just not ethical to do certain um, processes in assessment, um, particularly if it's hidden from students or if it applies mechanisms that would be unfair to certain students um, and favour others. And then there's uh, the overall accountability issues. You are ultimately accountable for all of these mechanisms and the how they are utilised and um, whether or not these principles are followed and whether or not the ethics and legalities are adhered to. So you need to be able to keep records of this so that if you are called to account, you can show evidence of how you progressed. Now, if you're following these things, that's generally part of that process. So you'll have strong record keeping and details. But there are some issues that teachers get caught up with. Taking assessment home to mark opens up a whole range of different possibilities of things going wrong, such as someone else being able to see the assessment items. Um, some teachers getting others to mark student work. Um, don't do that. Um, <laughs> uh, but also losing assessment items. That's one of the nightmare scenarios, and it happens all too often. Uh, so you, you need to be mindful that student work is students' work. It's their they have ownership of it. It may be in your hands for the pro purposes of assessment, but it is still the student's work and you need to give it back to them and they still have ownership of that. So again, things we don't often talk about in K-12 education, but they can arise, particularly if things go astray, such as losing assessment tasks and things of that nature. So in the main, these issues don't come up too often but they can, and so you do need to be aware of them and to follow the fundamental principles and processes of conducting assessment. Now, one of the more recent um, techniques used is cognitive verbs. Now, this is sort of a set language that is used across all schools and all teachers and all students so that um, the language barriers around assessment are reduced so that every student knows that if they're asked to perform a comparison, they know what that means um, versus doing a, an analysis task or a, an evaluation task. So these various verbs mean specific things in relation to assessment. And there was a common language um, established and everyone then knows what that means. And so when you set an assessment task, asking for students to be able to demonstrate their ability to analyze a, a piece of software to identify the various errors that may exist within that, then they know what needs to be done in terms of the directions that you're providing them. So you need to become familiar with the cognitive verbs, uh, read through those, and we'll explore those more in the tutorial.